appreciate that. Aren't you glad for no so salvation? Amen. Uh -huh. You can know you say. A lot of people, if you ask them, they say, well, I don't know. I have to wait and see. That's not what the Scripture says. John wrote, these things were written that you might know you have eternal Amen. life. Amen. If you don't know, then you probably aren't. Because if you have touched God and God's touched you, you know. Amen. And it can be settled. It can be settled real quick. It can be settled today. Oh, to know that it's you're right with God is one of the, it is the greatest blessing in this earth. To know that it's a, the house is, your house is in order and you're ready to meet God. Amen. It's real. <clears throat> I like that song. You join me in the book of Exodus. I know that I uh, put in here chapter 4, verse 2. Well, I can't just keep it to one verse. Chapter 3, verse 1, if you join me there. Exodus, chapter 3, verse 1. If you don't have a Bible, get one out of the hymnal rack. If, if it's not one there in front of you, reach over and grab one out of another rack. But I, I want you to see what's here in front of us today. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. For he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them out of the land unto a good land, a large and a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore behold the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore and I will send thee to Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Chapter 4 verse 1 And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord has not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put now thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he took it by his hand, and he caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, had appeared unto them. Father, would you take these old words and make them new? Breathe into them the breath of life, the Holy Spirit. May they blaze upon our heart today. May we hear anew as if we were before a bush on fire. In your name we pray. Amen. What is in your hand? Well, that was a question God asked Moses. And I believe it's a question He is still asking His people today. What are you holding on to? What do you have in your hand? Good question. That text, verse 2, is lifted out of a long conversation that we read some of, but not all of. It occurs in the Sinai wilderness there. 
Moses has been exiled from Pharaoh and from Egypt. He's been living out there for 40 years. He's got a place in the wilderness. He is away from civilization. He's a shepherd now by trade. He's good at it. But he has an encounter with God. God pays him a visit. You know the story. God will call him into the ministry, graciously call him, but he will reluctantly agree. You know what happened here. Moses will stammer and stutter and deny and argue with God. You got the wrong God. You got the wrong person. This, this mail that I got, it's got the, name, it got the wrong address. You got the wrong person. You're talking about some other Moses someplace else. The bookkeeping in heaven is all messed up. This went to the wrong address. It surely it can't be me that you're sending this to. And yet God will not relent. Chapter 3, verse 7, God says, I've seen the affliction of my people and I have heard their cry. Moses, have you, have you heard their cry? Have you heard the moaning of people oppressed? Has it come to your heart to understand what those people are going through? Are you so far removed you forgot? Moses, do you care? I do. Verse 9, the oppressed of my people in Egypt, they are like sheep without a shepherd. Moses, I need a shepherd. Will you go? Verse 10, come now, let's reason together. We'll go down there together, you and me, and I will set my people free, and I will use you to make this happen. Moses begins writing his resignation letter before he even got the job. But Lord, over and over and over, he begins to counter. Verse 11, I'm not the right man for the job. Verse 13, Lord, I don't even know your full name. We've just met. Verse 1 of chapter 4, but Lord, they won't believe me. Verse 10 of chapter 4, but Lord, I'm not eloquent. I'm not trained. I'm not gifted. I'm the wrong person. Please, you've got to believe me. I'm not eloquent at all. And yet, isn't it incredible? He was eloquent about coming up with excuses. He was not backwards at all. He just kind of spit that out right one after another. But Lord, but Lord, but Lord. Verse 13 of chapter 4, but Lord, please send somebody else. And in every excuse that Moses gave to the Lord, the Lord come back with another promise that he would be with him, he would help him, he would enable him, he would give him blessings and power, for he is sovereign over all nations, including Egypt. You don't have to worry about going down there because I'm already there. And there is no one there you'll stand before that is greater than I. Amen. So I'm sending you now. Chapter 4, verse 1, one of his most feeble attempts to argue with God. Have you ever tried to argue with God? <laughs> Some of us have. We, we, you don't win that argument, do you? But his argument was, Lord, they won't believe me. And so we read of this uh, sign that God is going to give him. He says to Moses, what's in your hand? As if God doesn't know. But he asked the question to cause Moses to take a moment and consider what he's holding on to so tightly. He said, well, that's a, a shepherd's rod. I use that to defend the sheep and guide the sheep and <coughs> corral the sheep. And God said, throw it down. Scripture says he cast it to the ground, just threw it down. And you good Nazarenes know what happened? turned into a snake. And what do people do when they see a snake? Uh, for, the, the, for the first time, he's got some sense here. He, he flees from that. And then it says that God gave him another order. What did he tell him to do? Pick, it up, by Pick the up that snake by the tail. I think to throw it down didn't take any faith at all. I think it took a lot of faith to reach down and pick it up. How many of you would like to pick down, reach down and pick a snake up by the tail? We'll have a sign-up sheet. How many, how many really want to go first? 
I think he stared at that snake for a while. I don't know what kind of snake it is. I mean, in this area, they've got some sand vipers. They've got some snakes that are just deadly. I don't know what, which one it was, but I think it took a lot of faith for him to trust God to reach down and pick that thing up. And he did, and it turned right back into his rod. And that step of faith transforms Moses because he realized God's serious. Well, there's another sign. Put your hand in your cloak. Pull it out. It was leprous. Put it back in. Pull it out. It's clean. That don't happen. That's a miracle. That just don't happen. That is nothing but God. Nothing short of throwing down a rod and it become a snake and then whatever. <coughs> Here we go. Moses and that rod are going to be forever linked throughout his lifetime. He's not going to be very far from it. You read in the, in the, the book of Exodus, he will go down to Egypt with his brother. That rod will be thrown down before Pharaoh. It will turn into a snake again. The magicians will try it. And then that snake of Moses will swallow them up and then it, he reaches down and it becomes a rod again. That rod, Moses will lift it up over water in Egypt and, and he will turn water into blood with that rod. He will lift it up and locusts will come. Lice will come. All kinds of plagues will come with that rod. Fast forward. They finally get out of Egypt. They're standing out there cornered in a, in a little cul-de-sac of land and in front of them is the Red Sea. Behind them, here come the Egyptian army. They're like fish in a barrel. God says, lift that rod over the Red Sea. And he does, and the waters part, and the Egyptians are, are fast behind, and the Israelites pass over safely. God keeps them safe. They get to the other side. What does he do? He raises the rod again, and God closes up the Red Sea, and all the Egyptian army is killed. Later you will read that he will take that rod out there in the wilderness and he will hit a rock and out of that rock comes living water and they will drink and drink for them and for their families and for their livestock and for all they've got an abundance of water. That rod will be used by God in the hand of Moses to bring signs and wonders and miracles over and over and over to minister to people. That rod surrendered. Nothing more than a common shepherd's rod, no different than any other shepherd would have. I don't know if you got it at Walmart's back now, but it looked just like everybody else's. Nothing special about it, but when it was given to God, look what happened. Miracles happened. Well, God asked him a question, what's in his hand? He said, it's a rod. That's what God asks us today. What's, what are you hanging on to? What do you have that you could use to minister to other people? That maybe you think is nothing that's just insignificant. There's nothing special at all about it. But if you would give it to God, He would use it to touch lives for Christ. To bring people into the Lord. To build the kingdom of God. What is it that God has gifted you with and that you need to give back to him for his glory. What is it that maybe you think is nothing but in the hands of God, it's something to impact others? Can I remind you, and not too many preachers will say this, but there is nothing different between sac sacred and secular if it's given to God. What you or others do in the workforce is just as good and just as godly. Can you understand that? That when you give your heart to God and you give your work to God, He receives it as a sacrifice and is well-pleasing in His sight. And it doesn't matter if you're driving a school bus or if you're sweeping floors or if you're cooking in the kitchen or if you're doing IT support. In the eyes of God, you've given that to God. He receives that as, as a sacred calling. Ministering to others, it, it, it is a blessing to Him. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatsoever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Give it to God and let Him use it to bless others. 
Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor is not in vain, and it doesn't matter what it's doing. If you're doing it right and you're doing it for God, He will bless it and He'll receive it as an offering unto Him. Whatever it is, it's in your hand. Now, God is not going to hold me accountable for playing the piano like some gifted people in this church here. Because that's not in my hands. He didn't gift me with that. God will not hold me accountable for be, being able to start an IV like Robin in somebody's <coughs> arm the first time and hit the vein. That's not in my hands. There are other things that some of you can do that I can't do. God will not hold me accountable for that. That's in your hands. That's what He gave you. But what is in my hands and what is in your hands, He will ask us and say, what is your in your hands? And have we given it to God and said, Lord, this is yours. Let me do it for the glory of God. So what are we supposed to do with what's in our hands? Preacher would say, number one, surrender it to God. Absolutely say, Lord, this is yours. If I'm baking cookies, let me do it for Jesus. If I'm sweeping the floor and mopping the floor, let me do it for Jesus. If I'm cleaning toilets, let me do it for Jesus. If I'm a truck driver over the road, let me do it for Jesus. Whatever your task is, whatever your calling is, if you're mowing yards, if you're taking care of babies, if you're taking care of the elderly, whatever it is, give it to God. Say, Lord, I want to do this today for you and give it to Jesus. God can't use anything that's in our hands until we let go of it and say, Lord, this is yours. And number two, I would say God really doesn't have us till He has what's in our hands. On whatever we're holding on to, if we surrender and say, Lord, this is yours, then He is free to use. It. And He will give Him the chance and step back and watch God. Whether it's a sling in David's hands, a jawbone in Samson's hands, or two months, widow's mites in the widow's hands. God uses it, no matter how insignificant it may be to others. No matter what it looks like to others, God, give it to God. He'll use it. Amen. I remember pastoring in Canton, Ohio. Danane and Paul, you're going to remember Linda. She was in our Sunday school class. I remember one Sunday she came to me and she was in tears. And I just trying to figure out, Lord, what do I say this time? She said, Pastor, every time they take the offering on Sunday, I just feel so guilty. Because being a homemaker, she said, I don't have an income and my husband doesn't give me any money at all. I have no allowance. And I want to give and, and I don't have anything to give and it just eats me alive on Sunday that I can't give. Well, Linda had a gift of baking. I knew that. I, I had enjoyed some of the stuff that she had made. And I'm praying, Lord, give me wisdom, give me wisdom. I don't know what to say. And just come to him. I said, Linda, does your husband give you any grief about when you buy groceries, if you buy extra baking supplies? She said, no. All right. I said, all right, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I said, this week, I want you to bake a cake. You bake, you bake a cake? She said, sure. I, I said, real good. Yeah. I said, and then when you're done and it's on the kitchen table, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray over that cake. I want you to just bow your head right there in your kitchen. And I want you to pray and say, Lord, this is for you. This is yours. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. And I said, and then I want you in the privacy of that kitchen right there. And I said, Lord, and who do you want me to give this to? And I said, don't argue with me. Whatever name comes to you, I want you to go deliver it. Take it to somebody and say, the Lord told me to give this to you. And I said, let that be your offering, and God will receive that with gladness. Let me tell you something. Whatever you got in your hands, Linda could bake, but I said, use that. 
Make that your offering. Give it to God. Surrender it to Him. And do it with a smile and all the love of Jesus. Which takes us to the next thought. Whatever is in your hand and whatever you do for the Lord, do it with joy. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul wrote in chapter 1, We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love. Your work of faith and your labor of love. You, you never separate the two. Work of faith should always be done as a labor of love. I remember uh, a preacher in Lancaster where I pastored before. Old guy told me, he said, you know, he said, what we do for God, he said, is just like milking a cow. And uh, he was a country boy at heart. And, and he said, it's just like milking a cow. And he said, you draw out a big old bucket full of milk with a lot of cream on top. But he said, if you don't use it with love, it's like kicking the bucket over. Whatever you do for God, do it with love. Because otherwise, it's like you've drawn out a big old bucket of milk, and, and if there's no love in it, you just kicked it over. And let me tell you something. God has rebuked me several times over this, where I went and did something, but it wasn't loving. And that has always come back to me and it haunted me. said, well, you just kicked the bucket of milk over. <laughs> oh, do it with love and joy. For God loveth a cheerful giver. Amen. I read this past week of a pastor who told a story. He got up, he preached the sermon Sunday morning, gave the altar call. At the end of the service, they waited. It was always... Nobody came, and then at the end, we're about to close, and one guy got up, and he came down and knelt and prayed and was gloriously saved. Later, we'll join the church. God did a deep work in his heart. The preacher would ask him later, he said, while he was discipling him, he said, and what, what did I say in the sermon that got your heart? And the guy said, well, I didn't hear a whole lot that you said. <laughs> I have to admit, he said, I don't remember anything. He said, but I was sitting there looking at the woman that was two pews up from me, and she's the one who invited me to church, and she has always been so kind to me here in town, and she's brought food to our house, and she's always done it with joy and a smile. And he said, I was sitting there, and it dawned on me, I want to be a Christian like that woman right there. And I got up and I came to the altar because of her experience, her life. Let me tell you something. I, I, the greatest sermon ever preached is a godly life full of joy and love for Jesus Christ that impacts people where they, Jesus is attractive and they want to be more like Jesus. Great sermon preached. Your life, my life, Impacts a lot of people, folks. Number three, serve with excellence. Paul would later write the same words in Colossians. Whatsoever you do, do it in word and deed, do it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter what it is. Digging a ditch, plucking chickens, store clerk, bank teller, Whatever profession, do it for Jesus. And sometimes can I say, you got to do it for Jesus. Because if you look at those people, you say, I ain't doing it for them. <laughs> they don't appreciate it. They don't even like me. Why, why do I have to be like Jesus? They're not. Jesus said, whatever you do. Sometimes we just have to say, Lord, they don't appreciate it. But I'm doing this for you today, Lord. And that is an offering that he will receive gladly. I'm doing this not because they're kind, not because they're nice. And let me tell you something, the public can be ugly. And if you deal with the public, you need to pray this a lot. Lord, let, love them through me. This is tough. Moses is going to deal with the public for the rest of his life. He's been living in isolation. He's cut off from the crowd in the big city. God's going to send him back. He's going to need all the love of God he can get. 
do it for Jesus, it will keep Moses on his knees the rest of his life and it will keep you and me on our knees the rest of our life if you're going to love like Jesus did. But do your work with excellence. Romans 12, 11 says, Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. The, the Living Bible says, Never be lazy in your work. Good Christians are good workers. Honest, dedicated, and, and, and we give them an honest day's work for an honest day's wages. But whatever we do, we do it with integrity, we do it with love, and we do it out of a heart for Jesus. Indira Gandhi said, My grandfather told me that there's two kinds of people, those who do the work and those who take the credit. He told me to try to be in the first group because there's no competition. <laughs> God bless those people that are still working, that are still out there with their stores open, those who are still trying to maintain some kind of business at all and keep it going and keep employees. God bless them. And that small handful of people that's still working, God bless them. I love this story I'm going to share with you as I close. Maybe you've heard this. I ran across it and I love it. A young man applied for a job as a farmhand. When the farmer asked his qualifications, he said, well, I can sleep in a storm. Well, that puzzled the farmer. He said, well, you know, on a tin roof, I can sleep too when it rains. But he liked the guy. Something about him just clicked, and so he hired him. Turned out to be a good worker. Turned out to be a lot of help. Fell and didn't realize how much he helped him. But it was about six weeks later, one night, in the middle of the night, a bad storm rolled through the valley. He jumped out of bed, his wife jumped out of bed because they're worried about livestock and the barn and crops and everything, and out the door they went. They had tried to get the young man up, but he was sound asleep. They couldn't wake him up, so they went out, only to find that the tools that they had used that day out there in the barnyard were all put away. The exposed hay that was uncovered, it was covered up under a tarp. He didn't even know when the guy had time to do it. The tractor that had been out in the field had been moved into the barn. The barn doors were fastened. The animals were all in the dry and calm and fed. He and his wife were standing out in the pouring rain getting drenched, and then he realized, he realized for the first time what the man meant, I can sleep in the rain. Meaning that he worked in a way that all that was taken care of, and nobody had to worry about his work. It was honorable. It was good. He was faithful and dependable. And so when the storms rolled in, the farmer was protected. God calls you and I to be dependable workers. We, we're called to be joyful workers. We're called to be honest workers. We're called to be godly workers. But whatever God has put in your hands, Give it to God. Whatever talent you have, you may say, well, it is nothing. Not of God's end. Can I remind you something? Moses was 80 years old when God said, what's in your hand? Give it to me. You may not be able to do what you could do 20 years ago or 30 years ago, but what you can do now and what's in your hand now, give it to God. Let him bless it. Let him use it. My brother-in-law told me yesterday, if we're not serving, we're not growing. The happiest people I know as Christians are those who are serving the Lord, found something to do for Jesus, and they're actively engaged in it, whether it's in the church or in the community or in their family or whatever. They are doing something for Jesus. So this is Labor Day. So you've been out of the workforce for a while. But if you're a Christian, you're not out of the kingdom of God workforce. There is no retirement until God takes us home. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, we are in your presence. We've been in your presence since we opened our eyes this morning. You're with us now. You was with us then. Here we are. 
We want to surrender to you right where we are today. All of us, the whole church, we just want to surrender to Jesus. We want to give you our life and not hold anything back. Number one, we want to give you our heart. It's yours, Lord. We want to give you our life. And the time we have left, it's yours, Lord. We want to give you our will. As contrary as it is at times, we want to give it to you right now. It's yours, Lord. And yes, Lord, our talents may not be as good as somebody else, but Father, it's what we have. We want to give that to you as well. Now, Father, receive all of that in the name of Jesus. And send us forth to be a blessing to others. Use us. Help us. Gift us. Embolden us. That, Father, whatever it is you, is on your list for us, may we not run from it or deny it, but embrace it and say, even so, Lord. We pray that in Jesus' holy name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you for being here on a holiday weekend. It's good to see you in church anytime. But God bless you for coming today. I'm going to ask us to stand. If there's somebody here that would like to pray, that you've got a need in your heart or something, I'm going to be here for a while. You get up with me. We will find a quiet place. And uh, you just unpack what's ever on your heart. And we'll pray together. Give it to the Lord. Don't leave with a burden. Don't leave with a burden. I'm going to ask my brother-in-law, Paul, if he would close the service with prayer, and uh, I'll meet you at the door. God bless you all for being here today. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this time. God, we thank you that we can come into your house and, and, and we can worship you. And we thank you that we can worship freely where our brothers and sisters Spirit, thank you for being our comforter, and um, we just thank you for this time, and we just ask that you'll uh, just go with us, just like you did with the Israelites in the wilderness. Just go before us, God, and just guide us and lead us back to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.